In this module, we're going to look at mergers and acquisitions. And we need to understand why companies would want to merge together, what are the potential benefits of this, and then we're going to look at how we're going to decide how much money we're going to pay for a particular company and how we're going to make that transaction happen. We must first of all understand the basic reasons why two companies choose to come together and stop being separate entities and decide to act as one new business. And the fundamental reason why they're going to do this is the belief that it's going to create synergy as a result of the two firms coming together. And we must understand that what we're still trying to do is maximise the wealth for our shareholders. It's just that now we have two types of shareholders to consider. The shareholders of the initial company and the shareholder of the company that's going to be merged with. Now, even though in the real world there is a technical difference between a merger and an acquisition, for the most part on this particular paper, as long as we consider two separate companies merging together into one company, it's effectively going to be the same. Whether it is a takeover or whether it's an equal partnership is not going to make much difference on this particular paper. But what we need to consider is we have to maximise the wealth of both companies. Both shareholders, both sets of shareholders, need to be better off as a result of coming together. Otherwise, whichever set of shareholders aren't going to be better off, they will resist the, this particular move. Now, very often you will see quoted that the basic definition of synergy is where 2 plus 2 equals 5. <laughs> this is very often quoted in textbooks. However, be very, very wary of making a statement like this in the exam, because unless you go on to actually explain exactly what that means, that does not make any sense and does not indicate to the markers that you actually understand what synergy is. A better, clearer way to define synergy would be to put the market value of company A plus the market value of company B is less than the market value of company A, B. What you then need to do is explain what this means in words and what this is fundamentally saying, if you were to value company A independently and then add it on to the value of company B valued independently, the sum of those two values would be less than the value of the company when both of these businesses merge together. And what it's trying to say is there is extra value created when these two entities merge as one that simply was not there when these two companies were acting independently. And what we need to do now is think about what sort of synergies are created when two companies can come together. Fundamentally, there are three basic types of synergies. Revenue synergy, cost synergy, and financial synergy. Revenue synergy includes market power. Being a bigger company, you will tend to attract proportionately more customers than you did before. There's the basic concept that people will choose to go to a company they have heard of as opposed to a company they've never heard of, even if the other company is cheaper, simply because you feel that you know what you are going to get with the larger business. Therefore, by merging with somebody else, you will develop a bigger brand awareness, more people will know who you are, and you will tend to attract a lot more customers as a result of it. The second thing to consider are complementary products. You may merge with another company that sell, sells products that complement your own products. And as a result of coming together, you very often can find that you can increase the sales of both products at the same time. A major advantage of merging with another, customer, uh, another company is the fact that you could potentially be reducing competition. If it is another firm that sells a competitive product to what you sell, you will no longer be competing with those people. And that's going to have the massive advantage of splitting the market in the sense that customers will no longer have to choose between somebody's products, somebody else's products and yours. It is simply going to be yours and potentially just one other person, which therefore could increase the, the market power that you actually have and therefore channel more business towards your company. 
The next type of synergy to consider is cost synergy. If by merging together with another business, you should be able to reduce your overall costs. Now, first of all, you should be able to benefit from bulk discounts. You can be buying more raw materials as a result of this. You should be able to argue a much, much better price from your suppliers. You should also be able to benefit from market efficiency in the sense that when you are advertising, you probably won't have to advertise quite as much now simply because you can advertise as one entity as opposed to two entities doing it separately. And depending upon the business, you may also be able to benefit from reduced fixed overheads. Your head office function and your support functions arguably won't need to be as big. Both the companies will probably have a human resources department, an accountancy function, and when these two businesses come together, there will almost certainly be some sort of overlap which will allow you to shed some of those costs and therefore become more efficient. Finally, we can consider financial synergies. First of all, companies that are larger should be able to borrow in bulk and therefore be able to get a much better rate on all of their borrowings. For two reasons. First of all, you are simply borrowing a larger amount of money and therefore you will tend to get a better rate. Secondly, the company will now have a greater asset base and therefore can offer greater security, which will again reduce the rate that they are charged. The opposite side of that they should be able to save in bulk. They may potentially have greater savings and then again they should be able to get a much, much better rate on their deposits. Also, depending on the types of business, they could be a diversification of risk. As we saw previously when looking at the capital asset pricing model, the more companies that you introduce into your portfolio, you will tend to reduce your unsystematic risk. And therefore, the whole business now should be less risky than it was before, which could ultimately be reducing your weighted average cost of capital and thus increasing the overall value of the business. But also think about not just in terms of overall risk, think about the risk of reduced cash flows. If you've got two businesses with different fluctuating cash flows, one business could have a cash surplus at one moment in time, the other company might have a cash deficit, and we could therefore offset these two amounts and ultimately save ourselves some interest charges. There could also be the benefit of offsetting tax losses. If one company has a tax loss that they can't offset against any profits, whereas the other company has tax to pay on their profits, by merging the two together, you can claim the full benefit of those tax savings immediately, as opposed to waiting for future profits to do so. So what we have here is a range of possible reasons why we think this merger between the two companies could be beneficial. These are the type of synergies that you could possibly create what we need to do in the real world is consider the true value of these synergies to try to work out whether this merger is actually going to be worthwhile or not. However, when we are merging with another business, we can actually classify the acquisition within three types. And depending on which type it is, this could have an effect on how you value the company you are taking over. First of all, we can have what's called a type 1 acquisition. This is where the acquisition will not affect the financial or business risk of the entity. This is implying that you are not going to have to take out any additional finance for this particular acquisition and the company that you are taking over operates in the same industry as you do and therefore they will have the same business risk. 
As a result of this, you should be able to value the target company using your standard weighted average cost of capital. If we have a type 2 acquisition, a type 2 acquisition will affect the financial risk, but not the business risk. This is implying that you are taking over a company that's already in your industry, therefore the business risk won't change, but you are going to have to take out additional finance to finance this particular takeover. As a result of this, to value this target company, you are going to have to use an APV approach. A type 3 acquisition will affect both the financial risk and the business risk. This is therefore implying that you are going to have to take out additional finance to finance this acquisition, but also you are taking over a company that's in a different industry to what you currently operate in. You are diversifying away from your current activities, and therefore you're going to have to face different business risk. Therefore, you're going to have to make an adjustment for that business risk using a risk-adjusted weight average cost of capital approach, but you're also going to have to adopt an APV approach to take account of the changing financial risk. One of the important things that we need to consider with mergers and acquisitions is why mergers and acquisitions fail to increase the shareholder value that we were hoping for. Once we understand why mergers and acquisitions fail to add the value, then we can start to consider whether we should take on mergers or acquisitions that are unlikely to add value, and if we do take on mergers and acquisitions, put control procedures in place to make sure the benefits we were hoping for do eventually come through. One of the main reasons why many mergers and acquisitions fail is that a lot of them are fueled by self-motivated managers. What I mean by this is many managers of businesses take over other companies, not because they necessarily believe that it's really going to add value for the shareholders, but they do so simply to improve their overall status. They therefore become the chief executive of a much larger business, making it easier for them to potentially move to another larger company for their next job. We also have the potential problem of over... optimism. When estimating the potential benefits of the merger, a lot of people get carried away and they get excited that this is a really great thing to do and then start exaggerating the revenue benefits we're going to have, the cost savings we're going to get, the potential increase in customers we hope to get from this acquisition. Where we've got to keep in mind that all of this is just simply going to be an estimate and there's no guarantee that it's going to come through. And a lot of people unfortunately err on the side of optimism as opposed to err on the side of caution when it comes to a takeover. We also get a potential problem of under-investigation of the target company. Once you actually make an offer for a target company, you can then start doing all of the due diligence to see what their financial position is actually like, but all of that takes a certain amount of time. And one of the problems that we have is if we want this acquisition to take place to start getting benefits, you want the acquisition to take place as fast as you possibly can. But the due diligence will take a certain amount of time. The more due diligence you actually do, the more information you will know about the business, but the more information you know about the business, the longer it takes and the less benefits you can start to reap from that business straight away. So you get this trade-off between the two. If we do a lot of due diligence, it's going to delay the whole process, but if we don't do a lot of due diligence, we may be missing information about this company and could end up buying a company that isn't worth as much as we initially thought. We then have a problem of lack of what's called follow-through with this takeover. 
People get very excited about making the offer, trying to find out if the target company is worthwhile. But once this offer has actually been put in place and the two companies come together, very often senior managers will then look for their next target to try to take over. But you have to manage an acquisition to make sure the two companies merge together well and you start to get the benefits. If that is not managed correctly, all those cost savings you were hoping for may not come through. And as a result of it, you don't get those benefits and you don't increase your shareholder wealth. Also, one thing that is very often overlooked is the cost of the acquisition itself. People very often say that we're going to get X amount of benefits by merging these two companies together, but what we do need to consider is the cost of investigating the company, the due diligence, all of the legal work, putting people in place to make sure we can start removing those costs that we don't actually need, changing all the company logos if you are going to change the name. All of these things do cost a lot of money, and as a result of it, if they're not taken into consideration, the potential benefits that you were hoping for will never be achieved to their fullest. So we just need to be careful when looking at an acquisition that we do seriously consider why we are making this acquisition. Is it in the best interest of our shareholders? What benefits do we really think we're going to get? And are they realistic? And are we going to be in a position to put all of these benefits in place in a cost-effective manner? When it comes to takeovers, however, in the UK, there is no particular law or statute that says things have to be done in a certain manner. However, there is a city code of conduct that indicates how companies that are listed on the stock exchange should behave with regards to making a, a takeover. Now, the detailed rules of takeovers are not examinable on this paper, but you should have an awareness of what you are trying to do with the takeover and the way in which you should do it. And as long as you fundamentally understand that you should be as informative as possible and don't do things just for speculation and you're doing it for the right interest of shareholders, you're not going to go far wrong. But a couple of the important points of the Code of Conduct are listed below. Two of the main points are, first of all, if a predator company obtains 3% of a company, it must be disclosed to the target company. Now, the reason for this is if you obtain 3% of a PLC, that is considered to be a very, very large proportion of that company. PLCs tend to have a very, very wide distribution of shareholders without any individual shareholder having a particularly large amount. Therefore, if you obtain a 3% stake in a PLC, you are considered to be a very dominant power within that company. As a result of it, you are required to let the target company shareholders know that you now own this stake. The reason for this is other shareholders in the company may no longer feel comfortable knowing that there is one person having such a large amount, and therefore once you've informed them, they then have the choice to sell their shares if they want to. The second thing to be aware of, if a predator company owns 30% of a target company, it must make an offer to all of the shareholders. Now, the offer has to be reasonable and it has to be made and be valid for a certain number of days, the details of which are not required for this paper. But if 3% of a target company is considered to be a large stake, 30% is considered to be absolutely massive, and you will have effective control of a PLC if you have a 30% stake. Therefore, it's not sufficient to simply let shareholders know that you have 30%, you become obliged to make an offer for the rest of that business. Now, the reason you make an offer for them is that the other shareholders who have the other 70%, if they weren't comfortable with you having a 30% stake in their company, it could be potentially difficult for them to sell their shares on the open market. Because who would want to buy more shares in that company knowing there is one shareholder who already has a 30% stake? 